I believe you're in the right place. You made it today. We're so proud of you. It's a packed house in here today. And everybody online, can we give them a big wave, everybody watching online right now? God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. You know, today we have a very special, not a guest, but I believe this is our family away from home. He's been with us for years, and many, many of, many years he's come here to The Way, and he's probably one of the greatest teachers I've heard personally that have come to this church, and I want you to be ready to receive from him. He's coming all the way from Arizona. He's personally, he's personally oversaw um, and launched out 1,200 pastors and churches all over the world. He's gifted in leadership. He's gifted to teach the word. So I want you to get ready. Get your notepads out. Get your Bibles ready because he's going to bless us with the word from God. Who is ready to receive this morning? Come on, who's ready to get a word from God this morning? If you are ready, I want you to give a big Way World Outreach welcome to Pastor Ray Kirkland. Amen, amen, amen. I feel the presence of the Lord in here. Amen. You may be seated today. I want to thank Pastor Marco and the staff and the leaders that have been able to invite me to be here with you again. I do feel like this is my second home. And I do enjoy being here. I know that you've been teaching on spiritual warfare, so I want to carry that same subject with you if I might today. I believe demons are real. Amen. When I was a young kid, I went to a church camp, and of course, my mom used to always say, birds of a feather flock together. And so I found a young girl by the name of Kathy, and we immediately connected because she had marijuana in her purse and other things. <laughs> and uh, we got in a lot of trouble during that camp, did things that you should never do it, even not at church camp. But uh, I remember the last night we went to service and the preacher was preaching. I don't know what he preached. I'm sitting there goofing around. And she's like dead serious, quiet. And I'm just thinking, what's up with her? Comes the altar call. She shoots straight down to the altar. I'm thinking, wow, that's a good cover, man. If you go down there, they won't think you're not saved. So I went down there and knelt down beside her. And all of a sudden, she manifested demons. And I, I really didn't understand. I was a preteen, and I'm looking at her. But I'll never forget when she turned, her head turned and looked at me, and she spoke. She's a little teeny 12-year-old girl. She spoke in a full man's deep voice, Raymond. Man, it freaked me out. I want you to know I'm going to come out of her, and I'm coming into you. Yeah, well, a few years later, I had to have deliverance. I found out demons are real. And they really attack people. And I remember one of the reasons I got invited when the church was much smaller to come and minister to a men's meeting one Saturday was because one of the young men attending your church had got set free from demons. I'd helped him in Oceanside years earlier, and that opened up doors to know some of your staff. And I came, and when I met Pastor Marco and the team here, I really appreciated them. I, I'm blessed to preach all over the world, but very seldom do you find a pastor that'll be straight up with the devil. Amen. Pastor Marcos doesn't back down. I mean, he goes straight after him. And I just, I mean, it immediately connected my heart to his because he understands it, knows it, that demons are strategic, they're militaristic, they're organized, they're deceptive, and they'll attack people's lives and destroy marriages and homes. And I appreciate that he goes straight after them. So today I want to talk to you about uh, spiritual warfare, how things work a little bit, um, I want to say that a lot of things that happen in our lives are not intuitive. What I mean by that, when it comes to spiritual things, some of the things that God's word teaches us are not just the natural way that we would do them. Let me give you an example, okay? How many of you remember the book of Job and the guy named Job in the Bible? This guy had everything go wrong. The Bible says that the devil had got permission to move against him and all of his children had been killed. All of his houses and his cattle and his barns, everything were destroyed. I mean, completely wiped out. All possessions are gone. And I want to read to you this scripture, Job 1, verse 20. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground, and worshipped. Now, that's culturally the way they would grieve in those days. They would shave their heads and tear their clothes. That's cultural. But what was different about his process 
is that he fell to the ground and worshiped. When you've just lost your children to a horrible, traumatic thing, when you've just lost everything you have completely, the first thing that usually we do is question God. Why? Why did this happen? What's going on? Why would you allow this? And we have questions. But I want you to see how Job dealt with loss. Maybe you're going through loss today. Okay? I want you to see how he dealt with the unexplainable. There's no explanation for what happened. He worshiped. Everybody say he worshiped. That's not intuitive. That's not usually the first thing we do. The first thing we do is say, God, what's going on? So maybe this year you've lost a, a marriage or a business or a child or a loved one or your health. Maybe today you're in the grieving process and you're, you're, you're not sure. It's unexplainable. You don't understand it. Let me give you something to do. Worship is the best medicine for dealing with a broken heart. When he worshiped, if you look at the story from that time on, it limited the activity of the devil. Up till that moment, the devil was just wiping him out. But when he worshiped, it slowed it way down because it brought God's presence into the story. Whenever you bring the activity of the Lord in, the devil gets stopped. Now hear me, it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to wonder why. But let your questions wait and let your worship come first. You can wait for questions, okay? Because five years from now, whatever question you ask is probably gonna sound silly anyway. The questions are secondary. The more important thing is that you worship. Job fell down and worshiped. When you don't know the answer, hear what I'm saying, when you don't know the answer, worship, because you're worshiping the answer. You worship the answer. Amen. And you bring the presence of Jesus into your temporary struggle. Because your struggles change. They change all the time. But what we need is his presence. And so Job learned this lesson. If you're feeling like the devil is messing with you, messing with your family, worship first. Everybody say that with me. Worship first, okay? I'm not downplaying the struggle, the pain, the, 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 the seriousness of what you went through. I just want you to remember that worship is the best thing you can do in spiritual warfare to stop the, 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 the process of the unexplainable. When it just doesn't make any sense. The devil's doing something and you don't know why, can't figure it out. Start with worship. Let me give you another example out of scripture, okay? It's found in Matthew 20. 15 verses 24 and 25, it's a little woman who has a demon-possessed daughter. Now listen, I, I'm a father of six, and I'm having my, my 18th grandchild to be here pretty soon. And uh, yeah, I got a big one. Trying to remember their names at Christmas is a, a challenge. <laughs> but when a child is going through something, when one of your grandchildren is going through something, when they're suffering, and you can't fix it, and you can't help them, it's traumatizing. It's painful, You're not, you don't know what to do for sure. And so this woman is suffering, and she comes to Jesus in Matthew 15, and he says to her, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. Okay, it's one thing when you go to your insurance company and they deny you. It's another thing when you come to Jesus and he denies you, right? He looks at her and he says, I'm not called to help out Mexicans. He says, bring it where we're living. I don't deal with honkies. That's what he says. I mean, it's offensive. It's offensive and, and I don't deal with Gentiles. I, I didn't come for you. And, and she stands there now, it's real easy at that moment to get bitter. It's real easy at that moment to just get offended and, and get all kind of bent out of shape and, and become angry. And most people do. Well, where's God when I need him? We, we go off. Okay? But she understands, I have no answer. He is the answer. Somehow she put that together. Thank God she did. And she began to worship him. Because when you worship him, you stop the activity of the devil. She worshiped him. Something about our Lord. When you worship him, 
he won't step over that worship. He will not deny it. And suddenly he stops, he looks back at her. Listen to me, the Bible says God seeks for people to worship him in spirit and in truth. When she does this, he looks at her and he says, your daughter is healed from this very hour. Amen. Everybody say with me, first worship. It'll stop the devil. It'll at least, it'll hinder his ability to have activity in your life. Now the next thing I want to talk about, again we're talking about intuitive things and understanding God's word. Sometimes we, we get it off. I want to talk a little bit about God's timing, how he operates. I want to start with two words. They're Greek words. I don't claim to be a scholar, but I can, I can study the, with tools. The first Greek word is the word chronos. Chronos. It's like a clock. Chronos is time that processes, like one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, January, February, March, 20, 21, 22. It's, it's, it's a process. It's minutes, seconds, hours, whatever it is, okay? It's where we get our English words, uh, uh, chronological, chronology, the book of Chronicles is the process of how the kings functioned. That's one word, chronos. Most of the time when we read the word time in the Bible, we associate it with chronos. The second word is kairos. Kairos is not minutes and seconds and times, it's moments, specific moments. It's a right moment, an opportune moment, a perfect moment. The moment of truth has arrived. It's a moment. Every good lexicon or Greek dictionary, when you study the word kairos, will always refer to the word opportunity because kairos is a window of opportunity. Now, opportunity does not mean that you're guaranteed anything. It just means you have an opportunity at a moment. This word, the etymology of the word, where it came from, the, uh, the origin of the word, was back from archers when they used to shoot bow and arrows at targets. So they would set a target up up here, one down here, one at the bottom, one over here and one over here. Now most archers could shoot and hit the target. But then they would take a tube, like a, a pipe, about yay long, and they would swing it across the front of those targets. And so you had to shoot the arrow through the tube, or the, they called it a tune. It's where we get the word opportunity. They shoot through the tune to hit the target. For that to happen, you gotta see it coming, shoot a little bit ahead of it, and make it go through. It's just a moment that it passes by. It's just a specific little area of time. It's a window of opportunity. So, so that's a very important understanding. There's moments that things are going by. The other word that I want to look at, there's, there's several, but it's, it's, it's the counterpart to kairos, the moment, the right time. And it's found in the Hebrew over in the Old Testament. It's the word eft. It's spelled E-F-T, but it sounds like eft. Okay, so let me explain to you why this is important in spiritual warfare. I'm gonna read three verses, and each of these verses is dealing with the devil persecuting the church. And I wanna just read them to you. Acts 8, verse one. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church was at Jerusalem, at that time. Acts 12, one. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Acts 19, and about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. When you just read that, it almost sounds like it's a fairy tale of some kind. It just so happened. One day, about that time, okay, it sounds like some kind of a fairy tale, but that's not the word chronos. It's not like a, a time. It's a kairos. Let me explain why that's important. A kairos is an opportunity a strategic moment, a, 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 a significant moment. It's a, it's a militaristic moment. And so here's what that's teaching us. The devil was watching the church. He was watching the church. And at a specific time, he attacked the church. At a strategic moment, he stirred up Herod to kill some people. At a strategic moment, he caused chaos in downtown San Bernardino. 
at a specific time, at a significant moment, at an epical time, at an opportune moment, he carefully was studying your life, your family, your marriage, your money. He's paying close attention to everything, and a significant moment he's coming after you. That's what that teaches us. Okay? So then we go to Ephesians 6. And Ephesians 6 is all about spiritual warfare as you get to verse 12. And it talks about we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers. They're the hierarchies of hell. We're wrestling against these things. Then it goes immediately in and tells us that we have weapons. We have an armor. We have the breastplate and the helmet and the sword and the shoes. We have these, these weapons. Then it says these words in verse 18, Ephesians 6, 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now, if you just read that in literal English, it sounds like you're supposed to be praying all the chronos, all the time, 24 hours a day. I'm supposed to pray always. How do I do that? I can't just pray always. I got to work. I got to talk. I got to eat. How do I pray always? But it's not the word chronos. It's the word kairos. It's to pray at specific moments. Let me put this in perspective for you with spiritual warfare. I'm going to read it so you can understand a little bit. With perseverance, there are strategic moments, significant opportunities that you need to be praying. Always in those moments you pray. And be on the alert, he says, for all the saints. Be very careful to watch. Let me paraphrase it a little bit more. Since we're in a war, and because we have a very real enemy trying to take us out, trying to stop us, and because we have armor, because we have weapons, we use those weapons, but be on the alert for one another. Be careful to pay attention to your family, to your loved ones, to your church, to your leadership. Be on the alert because you have an enemy who's watching every moment. He's gonna take every opportunity to attack your children. He's gonna take every moment that they're at school or they're away or they're with their friends. He's strategically watching where they're at, what they're doing, good or bad. And he says, sometimes you're gonna get a Kairos moment and you're gonna recognize that the devil is strategically trying to take them out. So I want you, he says, be on the alert for those moments. When you sense something is happening with a loved one, a saint, a child, a marriage, a, a, a whatever, when you sense something's going on in a ministry, you be on the alert and you start praying. You start praying right there. You discern the time. These are well-timed attacks from the devil, but you have a well-timed God, amen. And he'll stir our spirits. I hope you're learning something here. This is spiritual warfare. It's not when you think it's an opportune time for you, it's when the opportune is coming by. You don't get to choose that. Sometimes it's at one in the morning when your kid needs the prayer. Sometimes it's at 5 a.m. when the pastor needs the prayer. Sometimes your marriage needs a prayer at 11, 1130 or whatever. It's not chronos, it's kairos. It's certain moments, it's just certain times things are going on. He says, be careful to do it when I tell you to do it, pray always in those moments. Pray in those moments. Don't skip those moments. Don't, don't mess around. Those moments you pray, be on the alert. Everybody say, be on the alert. I had a pastor friend that was down in Guatemala, and his team and him had worked very hard for a few weeks. They're tired. They want to go home. They go to the airport. The airline says, sorry, we're not, we're not flying that flight today. You have to stay for another day. They don't want to stay another day. So they start arguing with the airlines. For three hours, they're arguing with the airlines about trying to get home. At the same three hours, there's a little woman back in America that suddenly discerns, I need to pray for that team. She doesn't know anything that's going on. She just simply knows it's a moment. The Lord is speaking to me right now. And she begins to pray and intercede. She's praying for them while they're arguing. The airline is saying, no, you can't go, they're stopping them. She's arguing that they can go. For three hours she prays for something she doesn't even know what she's praying about. She's just interceding. Suddenly the airlines finally gets tired of them, says, all right, we got you a flight, we'll fly into some other city, we're gonna get you out of here. The moment they, their airplane took off the ground, 
a major earthquake hit Guatemala City. In the next 30 seconds, 30,000 people were killed. One million people were misplaced from their homes. The whole country is only six million. Now, one million of those people are dislocated and outside. If they would have stayed, if they would have gave up and went back to their room, the hotel they were in imploded upon itself, concrete, they would have been smashed. Nobody knew that. That little woman didn't know that. They didn't know that. But the Holy Spirit knew it. The Holy Spirit moved upon that woman. She discerned it was a Kairos moment, and she began to pray. If she would have waited three hours till she got up to pray, they'd have been dead. God didn't need her to pray three hours later. He needed her to pray then. It's a moment. It's a right moment. It's a specific time. It's not your time. It's God's time. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is strategic warfare because the devil knows that he's going to do something. That he's going to attack a family. He's going to attack your kid. So what does he do? He gets you distracted doing something else so you won't pray. I don't have time to pray right now. I'll pray in two hours. Two hours from now is too late. He spoke to you to pray now. This is Kairos. It's a moment. It's swinging by. You don't get another chance. When it goes by, it's gone by. You've lost the child. You've lost the marriage. You've lost the home. Kairos moments. We have to learn that this is a spiritual warfare. The devil is taking every opportunity. He's strategically watching lives, but so is our God. And we can be in tune with our God, and God can help us. Amen. I know that every one of us should have a general time of prayer where every day we pray whatever time we pray, some time of the day, whatever. Everybody should have a regular prayer time. But on top of that, I'm talking about a discerning of the Spirit. I'm talking about when suddenly there's an opportunity that comes. Suddenly there's a moment that comes. Now the Bible talks about two words for the word bearing, like bearing up somebody. One of them means to carry something for them, to bear it for them, carry it for them. The other one means to stake, stake up something, like you would put a, a stick or a stake next to a tomato plant so that it can stand the weather. You stake, okay? So, so we're called, this, this word here, be alert for one another, pray for one another. Watch out. What it's saying is when you see that somebody's under the attack, your child, your marriage, your pastor, your church, you stake yourself next to that person. You, you, they're, they're weakened. For, doesn't mean they've done anything wrong. It means they're under attack. And you basically are saying, I'm here with you in this moment. My strength will join with your strength and you're gonna make it. I'm gonna join with you. How many of you would like somebody to join with you every once in a while? They don't need all the details, they're just the stake. I can say to somebody, I'm struggling, and we're having a struggle with one of my children. I don't need to tell them all the details. I need a stake. I need somebody that will take that moment and actually really pray with me. I need somebody to take that Kairos time because I can't wait two months. I might lose that child. I need him now. Amen. Now that same word Kairos is the word eft. Eft is the way it's said in the Old Testament. I want to read you an Old Testament scripture. It says, my times are in your hand. My Kairos, my eifts are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. In other words, he's saying, my enemies are attacking me. But God, you hold my specific moments. You hold my opportunities. You hold the, the appointed times for my life. My times, my kairoses are in your hand. The enemy is trying to take advantage of me, but you hold my times. Rescue me in this moment. That's a great one to listen because there's going to be moments when you don't understand what's really happening, but you feel the devil's got you in his target. You say, God, I don't understand, but you hold my times in your hand. Listen to this one, Zechariah 10 verse 1. Ask for the rain from the Lord at that kairos, that eighth time of the spring rain. Ask for rain at the time of rain. Sounds kind of strange. 
This is symbolizing spiritual rain. So he says, when you sense or discern it's time for an outpouring of the Spirit of God, ask for it. Ask for it. Maybe somebody is prophetically comes out through the Word of God. Maybe you discern it. Maybe it's a season. Okay, we have a window of opportunity right now in this church for El Salvador. We don't have a guarantee that in two months from now, we'll have that same window. So we're at a moment that we can all see that God has opened a door. So he says, when you see it and you know it, ask me for it. Ask me for it, pray for it. I don't need you to pray after they're there or after they've come back, I need you to pray now. Now let me ask you this, oh, how do I say this? The Bible says, as the stars of the heaven and the sands of the seashore, let me explain that really quickly. That's Israel and the church. Whatever happens in Israel is gonna happen in the church. What's happening in Israel today? Yeah. What, what season are we living in right now? The last days. We are in Psalms 84 wars right now. The next war on the map is Armageddon. We are right at the rapture of the church. We are right there. I can't, I'm not telling you, the time, I'm just telling you we're in the season, we're in the moment. What does God want to do in the last days? What spiritual outpouring does he want to give? He wants your sons and daughters to prophesy. He wants your old men to dream dreams. Ask me for it. Ask me for it. He says, I'm coming back for a bride that's spotless. Right now, I'm not so sure how spotless we are. But we know that's what he wants to do. That's what he wants to do. And it's right now he wants to do it. Ask me for it. Don't just let this season pass by. Step into the season and ask me when it's the time for that. There's an opportune moment that if you will ask me, I will pour out my spirit. In Genesis, God gave man dominion over the earth. Man has dominion over the earth. God did that, gave it to us. He will not violate his own word. So what happens now is we are to cooperate with the mind and the will of God. In other words, God's not just gonna move without us opening the door. We are the, we, we've rented the house, we've leased the house, God owns it. But just because you own a house, you don't just walk into somebody else's house. So God's knocking on the door right now saying, we're at the last days, we're at the end times, open the door, ask me to come in. Ask me to move, ask me to enter this situation with you. Ask me to work with your marriage. Ask me to work with your children. Ask me to work with the ministry. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Discern the season. It's a right time, it's an opportune time. Ask me. Now a lot of people have a, a view that God won't do it just does whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. That's simply not true, okay? Because he gave dominion to man on the earth. Listen to Ezekiel twenty-two thirty. I searched for a man among them who would build up a wall and stand in the gap in San Bernardino. I'm looking for somebody to stand in the gap over there at the, the Gomez family. I'm looking for somebody to stand in the gap over there in Kirkland land so that I would not destroy it. But I found no one. Listen, church, let me break that down. God says, I must, as a holy God, judge sin. I cannot excuse it. I cannot excuse it, I'm gonna judge it. But I'm seeking for somebody on the earth that I can cooperate with that will open a door for me and ask me and if they will ask me, I will give mercy. If they will ask me, I will give grace. If they will ask me, I will save their families. I will move in their lives. If I could find somebody, I wouldn't have to bring judgment. Sadly, he found no one. Amen. Amen. We have to learn to discern the times. We have to learn to see what's happening with our children. You send your kids off every day to school. You send them right into all kinds of false teachings, all kinds of stuff. Amen. We know that God wants to protect them. 
ask me. Every day when you send them, ask me. Ask, somebody say, ask me. Ask me. Amen. One more scripture, a couple more scriptures. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not grow weary while doing well. In due season, we will reap if we do not lose heart. In due season is the word idios kairos, which means this. Kairos, we know, is the right time, the opportune moment. Idio means ownership. Something is due to you. Somebody owes you something. So here's how that passage reads. Don't grow weary in all your well-doing because you own a kairos. You own a right time. You own an opportunity. You own an appointed time. I, I will visit you. I've given you a kairos. I'm giving you an opportunity. I'm giving you a moment. I, I've given it to you. Don't give up. This is not a guarantee. It's an opportunity if you don't faint. But if you faint, you lose it. If you quit praying, you lose it. We have to be sensitive, church. We gotta pay attention. Am I making sense? In the back row, back slider row, you guys getting it? <laughs> I love you guys, don't worry about it. John 7, 6. Jesus is gonna do one of his first miracles, but listen to this verse, he says, my time has not yet come. Remember his mother came to him and asked if he would turn the water to wine and all that. Remember that story where he turns the water to wine? First thing he tells his mom is my kairos, my moment. My, actually, actually that word there is chrono. My chronos, my time. It's not quite time, mom. Listen to me. But mom, ask. Mom, ask. Hear me, moms. Hear me, moms. Somehow women have an intuition. They can sense when their kid's in trouble. Their husbands are boneheads. They don't know what's going on. <laughs> Somehow that woman can figure it out. Something ain't right. Something's off. Something's off here. Okay? Mom discerned the moment. She discerned you talking Kronos, but I'm talking Kairos. And she discerned it. She puts pressure on him. So the Bible says he never did anything without the father's permission, so he must have went to the father, and the, the father said, do it. Here's what I want you to catch. She asked, when she did, she slipped it into a moment, power was released, and he stepped into miracle ministry. Here's what I'm saying. First thing you do when the devil's attacking you is what? Worship. Say it with me. Worship. It's not intuitive. It's not what's natural. Worship. Second, be on alert. Be on alert. Discern. Pay attention to the times, the seasons. Ask. Next thing is ask. When you know you're in a season, ask for it. Your, your daughter only gets married one time, hopefully. <laughs> ask for God's presence on it. Some people... Most people I know, they only die one time. Some get raised from the dead. But that's a moment in a family. It's a moment. As a pastor, I do a funeral. It's a moment to reach that family. I don't get that moment two weeks from now. I get that moment now. Ask, before I go, I ask God, give me words of wisdom to speak here. Help me to understand what you would say to this family. What would you do here, Lord? Ask. When you know you're in a season, a special moment that doesn't come back again, ask. And finally, I want to say, act, A-C-T, act. Ephesians 5, 16 says, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Another translation says, make the most of every opportunity. New King James says, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Redeem means to be bought by Jesus' shed blood. I like this translation the best, the best I could study it out. Purchase every opportunity. Purchase it. In other words, Spend whatever you got to spend. Spend your time. Spend your sleep. Spend your convenience. Spend whatever day. You might not get another chance to talk to that kid. He might going to be getting a car and anything horrible could happen. 
When God puts a season on you, a moment on you, act. Don't sit around and wait. Do something. Purchase that moment. Serve in that moment. Give in that moment. Whatever it takes, purchase that opportunity. Don't lose that opportunity. You're not guaranteed to have another one. Amen. Pay whatever price you have to pay. Take full advantage of the opportunity, the moment, the time. Babies are only born one time. It's a critical moment. It really is. Not just for the birthing, but for what's going to happen in that family. Speak a word into that. Amen. You don't always get opportunities. Now, we all have general time, like I'm running out of time right now. Not because you need to go home, but because I'm hungry and I can already smell the tacos. But I'm trying to say to you, we, we live in Kairos moments. Kairos moments. And sometimes children are better at it than all of us. They'll sense us something. They'll sense something's off. Or they'll sense something. I'm going to close with this story. There was a, a doctor, American doctor, who was living in Central Africa. And one night there was a woman there in the village. Her husband had passed away. She had a two-year-old daughter. And she's now giving birth to a baby. He worked with this woman all night long in her labor, but she didn't survive. She passed. And the child survived. So now the doctor has a two-year-old child and an infant. Very cold at nights where they live because of the elevation up in the mountains. And no incubators, no electricity, no water bottles. Very difficult. They wrap the baby in some rags they found to try to keep it warm. And the following morning, the infant's life was really at, at stake. And so he called all the little children from the orphanage to come and pray for the little girl and the baby. And when they came there, he suggested to one of the 10-year-old girls in the orphanage if she would lead the prayer. And here's what she prayed. Please, God, send us a water bottle. It will be no good tomorrow. God, because the baby will be dead. So please send us the bottle this morning. The doctor, oh, wow. Then she continued, and while you're about it, would you send a little doll for the little girl so she'll know that you really love her? That was her prayer. The doctor said, beautiful prayer. The kids went about their business. They go and do whatever they do, play and do whatever they do at the orphanage. In a little while, a servant come running to the doctor. Now, it had been four years since the doctor had received any packages or parcels from anywhere. But this guy comes around, hey, there's a car at the gate. They want to deliver a, a package. Well, he went to the gate, and by the time he got there, the car was gone, but there was a 22-pound box sitting there. So they brought the box back up to the orphanage. They opened the box up, and sure enough, there was, the top of the box was covered with little knit jerseys, little colorful jerseys the kids could wear. There was some bandages there for leprosy patients. There was a box of nuts and raisins. And in a sealed plastic bag was a bottle of water with four nipples. Okay. The little girl, the 10-year-old girl, sees the bottle of water, and she starts shouting out, Whoa, Jesus did it! Jesus did it! And, and then she says, then she says, if God sent a bottle... I bet there's a dolly too. They dug down in there and sure enough, there was a little doll in the bottom of that box with, with little dresses and stuff in there. Then she said, can I give the doll to the little 22 year old girl so I can tell her that Jesus really loves her? Now here's what I want you to hear. That parcel had been mailed from the United States like eight months earlier. It had got left in the post office area, whatever, wherever that's at in Central Africa, in a corner. It had been sitting there for months. At the time that little girl, at the time, at the moment, the, uh, amen, she prays, there's a guy at the, he's bumping that box, I'm tired of stepping on this box. Where does this thing go? He looks down and it goes to the orphanage. Are you listening to me? He picks it up and hand delivers it himself because he doesn't want to step on it. That box could have been thrown away. That box could have never made it. He could have opened it, taken the stuff home himself. 
But God was working in cooperation with somebody on the earth. He was waiting for permission. That little girl, are you hearing what I'm saying? Stepped right into that moment and asked for it and believed for it and had faith for it and moved the hand of God. Amen. We're talking about spiritual warfare. Maybe you've had some hard hits and you, don't, you can't even understand where's it coming from? What? Worship. Worship. If you look at your brother and your sister and you say, man, like everything's gone. They've had this sickness, this sickness, that car quit, that house burned down. Pay attention. Be on the alert. They're under attack. Stake yourself to them. Stake yourself to them. It's a moment. You don't get that moment every day. Are you hearing me? You're watching your kids go to school. You're seeing they're the wrong kids. They're hanging out the wrong crowd. Stake yourself. Pray. Ask. Be on the alert. Discern. Notice, notice the moment. See the moment. Pray. Are you hearing what I'm saying? These are the moments. This is how you defeat the devil. You can't just do it in your general prayer. I'm not saying don't general pray every day. Uh, every day have some prayer. But there's moments that God will call you. And usually they're not at the moment you would ask for it. It's usually during the middle of the night. For me, I don't know why. The Lord loves to work in the middle. He does some of his best work at the midnight hour. All through the Bible, the midnight hour. I just keep saying, can you work at about 8 o'clock, Lord, 8 o'clock? <laughs> I want you to bow your heads. Thank you for being so attentive and giving me time today. There's a window of opportunity that we're all living in right now. Israel's under attack. They're attacking Iran. These are last day moments. Our nation is facing an election that's going to change the face of everything. The church has this moment. We have the next few days to change everything in our nation. Three weeks from now is too late. Praying after the fact is okay, but you can miss these moments. You're going to discover as you've heard this that you have many moments that come with your family, with your ministry. You got to learn to seize them. You got to learn to recognize them. The devil is watching them as well. He's very strategic. He's carefully paying attention when to send Herod, when to create commotion, when to attack and persecute. He's very attentive. You have to be attentive. Start with worship. Now, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed only because we're trying to have reverence and not be distracted by everybody's moving around. To be able to discern what the Lord would have you to do, you need to have the Lord in your heart. That begins when you say, Father, forgive me for all my sins. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've made some errors. I want you to hear me very carefully. Jesus will forgive you of every one of them if you ask. You have to ask has to be sincere from your heart. Lord, forgive me. When you do that, he comes to live in you with the Holy Spirit, and you're able then to discern what to do about your home, your marriage, your, your finances, when to move, when not to move, how to move. I was sharing with the pastor before the service was, sitting with a man yesterday at a Toyota dealership the day before. He made one investment as a young man in a, one company. Basically, he felt the Lord tell him to do it. Today, he's a multi, multi-millionaire. He caught a moment when a company went from public, or from private to public. Something stirred in him. He sensed it. He responded to it put $10,000 in there and hasn't touched it since and he just makes millions. Moments. None of those things ever happen. Not really, not without the Holy Spirit's help. The Holy Spirit makes us sensitive to those God moments, those kairoses, those apes. It makes us sensitive. 
That happens when we ask Jesus into our hearts. Pastor Ray, Pastor Christian, leaders of the church, whoever you, whoever, I'm going to raise my hand as a sign of surrender. I want Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I need him more now than ever in my life. I am have so many questions, so many things I don't understand. They're unexplainable. Start with worshiping. Look to the answer. Look to Jesus. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand up high and set it back down. I see this hand and this hand. Hands are going up all over the room. Hands are going up all over the room. In a moment, we're going to stand. And everyone that raised their hands, I'm going to encourage you to step out of the aisle. I know it's a little bit difficult, but come down and pray with somebody. We're all here to pray for you. We've all done it. I've, I've done it many times. I just need God's touch in my life. Don't be embarrassed. Jesus drug a cross down a dirty road, was beat by people in public. We're asking you to walk down a carpeted aisle to people with smiles on their face. Just come and say, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, forgive me. Cleanse me. At the same time, there's many of you, look up at me for a minute, just for a minute. I'm going to let you go. I've cast out a lot of devils in my life. I've never asked for this ministry. I don't go around turning over every rock trying to call it a demon. But I've dealt with demons in 135 countries. Amen. They're pretty much the same everywhere. Here's one thing I've known. If you have a demon-possessed person, they usually know it. They might not be screaming like Hollywood, ah, all that stuff. They know they got a darkness in them. They know it's there. They're dark. They've got secrets that they don't tell nobody. And I don't, I'm not telling you to tell anybody. Sometimes, it, but you got to tell the Lord. You need help. You need God to set you free. So I'm going to, while we do this, I'm going to ask you to not be afraid. Come down. I'm not asking you to confess all your stuff to these people. I'm saying I want you to come and just worship for a moment. Then maybe somebody will pray with you and say, God, I discern you're moving in my life today. I want this darkness out of me. Lord, you said that my kairoses are in your hand, that you would cause the enemy to run. I place my life into your hand. Every opportunity, every, this is my moment, Father. I want you in my life. Drive darkness from me, drive demons from me. Some of you feel that the darkness is in your children or in your marriage. You just can't even talk anymore. You end up in a fight every time. Come down here and say, Lord, I take back every Kairos from the enemy. I'm not going to let him have the, the, these opportunities. These opportunities belong to you, Lord. I want you, Father, I'm asking you, move in my child's life. Move in my marriage. Change things, Lord. First, come and worship. We're going to be singing a worship song. Worship for just a moment, then ask. Worship first. Be alert. Ask. Discern it, then ask. And then act it out. Let's stand all over this room. Come on. Let's stand over this. This is a holy moment. This is a holy moment. Be careful how you handle this moment. It's a holy moment. The altars are open. Would you come? Would you come, Pastor Christian? Guys, right now, these are one of those messages that when we capture this and we live with this word for the rest of our lives, we'll never miss a moment that God has for you or your family. How many want to go the rest of your lives and never miss that opportune time, the God word, the God moment that God has for you? You're saying, I never want to miss a moment that God has for me. Come on, give God praise for Pastor Ray Kirkland and that message. What a powerful word that will change our life forever. Can we give a hand for all those that came forward today to give their life to Jesus? Aren't we so proud of every person? We're so proud of you. I want to say this to everybody that came forward. It just so happens that this week is the last class, the last wave of Holy Warriors classes this year. It just so happens you guys are coming to the altar today. And this week, 
you can step into our classes called Holy Warriors. These classes, we're going to help you get baptized. We're going to help you grow in your walk with God. And they launch Tuesday night or next Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Whichever, whichever time works for you. Whatever Kronos time works for you. The person in front of you, they're going to pray with you. And they're going to get you signed up for this class. But let's do this. Let's bow our head. Let's close our eyes. Repeat this after me. Say, Jesus. Close your eyes and say this. Say, Jesus. Thank you. I believe in you that you died on the cross and you rose from the dead so that I can be saved and set free. So right now, I ask that you'll forgive me of all of my sins. I repent from the way I've lived and I give my life to you. From this moment forward, my life is in your hands. Lead me, guide me, and Father, from, uh, and from now on, I pray that I will live in every opportune time that you've given me. Thank you, God, for saving me in this time. In Jesus' name I pray, and we all say amen. Before you go, lift your hands right now. I want to pray for everybody here right now. Lift your hands all over the church. Father, I pray for every person in this church from the front row to the back online right now. And I pray that every day that we live, we will not miss the moments, Lord, that you have called for us. You are doing things behind the scenes in our favor. You are working things out for our good. And even if it seems like we're in the middle of the storm right now, we commit to worshiping you and glorifying you even in the middle of the battle and the fight. So bless everybody here. I pray that you'll bless them and their homes and their family as they go and as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray and we all say, Amen.